Welcome back into One Soccer. Today we have another Ollie joining the party as we welcome on in Director of Football for the Canadian Premier League, Oliver Gage. Oliver, thank you so much for taking the time as Andy and Oliver Platt are still with you. I wanted to start off by some news that was released earlier this month by the Canadian Premier League, and that was lifting the curtain on finances, in particular as it comes to salary structures for each team. Can you tell us why now? Why decide to be transparent heading into year three? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, as the director of football for the league, I'm not solely responsible for communications and strategies like this, so I can't speak for the whole league itself, but. Um, I think it's something that we've wanted to do uh, and something that we always had planned. And as you can imagine, with a new league, um, there's an awful lot of stuff that we've had to have figured out um, in the last couple of years. So it's not necessarily a case of we're doing this because of this or that that's just happened. I think it's just naturally we're always going to do it. And it's around time that we've got stuff figured out on our end and it's, it's the opportunity to do so. Hey Oliver, um, firstly I think you, if I remember correctly, you had a, a big January signing in your household, so congratulations on that and I hope everyone's doing well um, in your family there. Um, I, I wanted to ask you Thank a you. little bit about um, the salary cap and, and one of the big discussions really that's been on social media and some fans have been having over the course of the off season um, regarding salaries is this category of players kind of in their mid to late 20s um, that were in the league last year but maybe aren't finding clubs and, and new contracts this year so you had Luca Gasparotto as one example decide to retire and, and move on to a different career um, Dylan Carrero was one name that, that kind of a lot of people talked about that was surprised wasn't going to be back in the league this year is, is there any concern in the league office um, about kind of retaining that category of player or, or what's, you, what's your take on, on kind of those kind of situations and, and how that's transpired this offseason? Yeah, um, you know, it's very difficult to speak to each individual player situation. You know, everyone has their own life. Everyone has their own decisions to make. Um, I think what's important to remember is what this league is at the moment and what this league always was meant to be when we launched it. Mm -hmm. So we've had some tremendous success stories on the young players that have come into the league, played very well for a year or two years and have managed to move away, whether that's being transferred for some money, uh, which is always great for our clubs, or left on a free transfer to go and pursue you know, a career in Europe or wherever it happens to be. And then there's also um, a need to build the football industry in Canada with some of the returning players. So players like David Edgar, players like Kyle Becker, some great, you know, Marcel de Jong, some great Canadian players that have been away, had their career and come back. And now maybe they'll step into a front office role or a coaching role. You know, the league has just financed a number of coaching courses for a B license for some of our players. We're trying to not just build the front end of their career, but also the back end of the career. And as it stands right now, the CPL, we know what we are. We know our place. We are currently a place that's trying to develop Canadian players. And we are still embracing players moving away from this league at the, the very peak of their career. So right now, there might be a concern about this kind of middle age group, but we think we're doing a really good job with the young ones. We think we're doing a great job with the older ones. And we still want to see this middle group of players move away from the league to have the, the kind of peak of their career right now. And mm -hmm. if players choose to retire, if that doesn't work out for them, no one at the league office or no one in the clubs can tell players what they should and shouldn't be doing. But I think it's important to remember that we've done some great things for the young and the old group right here. And there are options for the middle-aged players and it's up to them what they want to do with those options. Mm -hmm. Two years in, Oliver, and if we talk about the Canadian Premier League as a whole, there seems to have been a lot of boxes already checked off with accomplishments. I know we talked about a CPL team defeating an MLS team in a two-legged affair in the Canadian Championship, and I'm sure I could go on, but I'd rather have you mention uh, maybe some of the things that you're proud that the CPL has been able to accomplish in two seasons, and then what are some of the other targets? What are some of the other goals that you would like to see the CPL accomplish in the near future yes yeah, certainly so it's um it's funny when we were building the league in 2018 and into 2019 yeah we had a we did have a number of things on the board of 
it's not if this is going to happen, but when it's going to happen. So when are we going to sell a player? When are we going to beat an MLS team? When are we going to have a Canadian called up to the national team? When is a player going to become a coach in the league and transition and make that transition? And as it so happens, you know, we ticked off an awful lot of those boxes in year one. And I think we, um, we surprised even ourselves. You know, obviously, Cavalry's win against the Whitecaps goes down as one of the, the huge moments of the year. You know, Forge uh, beating Olympia in CONCACAF League was, was pretty incredible for how big a club they are. And I think on the field, some of those targets that we thought might come in 2024, 2025, 2026, we, we kind of hit in 2019. So it was really great to see. Obviously, 2020 has been incredibly tough. It's very difficult to say what targets we did hit other than we managed to get a very successful Island, Island Games done against terrible circumstances across the world. Um, you know, what are we looking for now? Um, maybe we're looking for the first million dollar transfer. You know, maybe we're looking for the first Canadian Premier League player to start a competitive game for Canada in a, you know, in a qualifier somewhere. Um, some benchmarks that show, okay, we've got off the ground, we've got past stage one, maybe even stage two. Now we're here, you know, now we're really here. Now we're in stage three and now we mean business. I wanted to ask you, Oliver, about the, uh, the CPL's partnership with the 21st Club. Um, this is something that I think is, is really, really interesting as, as an initiative. It's something that I don't think is, is really common or I haven't seen anywhere else around the world to, to do it in the way the CPL is doing it. And it is something that's, that's different and unique about the CPL. Um, I, I appreciate that it's difficult to judge last year just because of all the issues with travel and visas and, and so on and so forth. But, but just firstly, what, what's your kind of assessment so far of, of that process? process and how that partnership's worked? Um, I think so far there's signs, there's, there's signs that it's been successful. You know, with an, any program like this, there's going to be teething problems. Are you going to knock every single transfer out of the park from day one? Like, no, of course not. And that doesn't happen if you don't have the partnership with 21st Club, you know. Um, but, you know, Alex Marshall came in, Jamaican national team player, did well, showed glimpses that over 28 games, he could be a real player in this league. You know, Alex Diaz came in in Pacific, scored some goals, um, a kind of a byproduct of the program. We got Acuna into Ottawa, um, who came through the same system. So one of the agents we were talking to, thanks to the program. And I think everyone could see what a quality player he was. So there's definitely signs that the process is working. Every single year, if you are not trying to get better, then you're moving backwards. If you're happy to stand still, you're moving backwards. So it's going to improve. We're, there's going to be some changes made at some point, I'm sure. It's going to evolve. But right now, we're, we're pretty happy with the progress so far. Mm -hmm. Speaking of progress, we would love to see a 2021 season, and we know that all the provinces are at different uh, phases when it comes to opening up and, and, and allowing certain things to happen. Um, Ontario still remains the most restrictive, and that obviously is a home for quite a few of the Canadian Premier League teams in, in Forge FC in York, and obviously that can't be easy, and obviously at Atletico Ottawa. Where are we as far as, as getting permission preseason and really kind of nailing down a start date because I know Commissioner David Klanikin said he wants to target Victoria Day weekend, but how realistic do we think that is given certain government restrictions still? Yeah, so uh, the government, the political side of everything is, is certainly not in my mandate. You know, I, um, I'm very much a football person. My job is to, uh, to impact the, the quality of fields on the play, uh, quality of play on the field, sorry. Um, of course, training and getting back to playing plays an impact in that, but it's, uh, it's certainly a conversation that's happening in um, different areas of the league office to myself. What I can say is at no point is the league office interested in holding teams back. Um, I don't think we're ever going to see a situation where, okay, if the, if the uh, Ontario-based teams can't train, then you know we can't train in BC or over in Nova Scotia or anywhere like that. I think... The guys have missed so much football over the last 18 months that to hold them back by a day at this point would be the wrong thing to do. So we will embrace training as much as possible whenever teams are ready, as long as we have government sign off and uh, the right medical processes are in place.